if we don't acknowledge that we've got these stress fractures that are going to be happening to us as leaders, then we're not going to heal correctly. And that healing process is just as important as the stress fractures. So I think it behooves us uh, as people who sit around and talk about growing leaders and challenging leaders to not avoid the difficult, to not avoid the suffering, to not avoid the conflict, to lean into those things, right? If we're going to be ch uh, planting churches, we're spiritually attacking the enemy's territory. There's going to be conflict. There's going to be blowback. There's going to be stressors. Okay. If we do that and we don't learn how to heal from those things properly, then we're not going to grow stronger. We're actually going to fall apart. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the H3X podcast with your hosts, Mark Gearing and Dave Miller. We are excited to continue discussing what we do every week, the head, heart, and hands of the Multiplying Church and her leaders. Uh, today, we're going to jump into a topic that both Mark and I are probably a little awkward about because we probably don't do it very well, but we do recognize its uh, importance and role. Lament in the life of a leader. What do we do when we're frustrated, disappointed, disillusioned, um, when things are just not going the way that we want, or when things have gone really well and someone, it's time for them to leave, or uh, someone leaves for good reasons, someone leaves for bad reasons, but anytime we face the loss of something, it has the potential to do one of two things, and that's what we want to jump into today. Uh, first one is it's going to build resolve. And it's going to move us towards mission, uh, or it has the potential to build unhealthy habits that will ultimately start to tear cracks in our foundation and tear us down as leaders. And if we're not careful, we'll take us out of the game completely. So we decided we would talk about the uh, unusual topic of the lament and the life of a leader. All right, Mark, you get to jump in now, since you said, I'm not very good at this, neither am I. But uh, what's some things that you have and know about this uh, idea here in your own life well yeah so uh that's what i said before we hit record to dave was uh this is not a topic that i feel like uh first of all i'm like excited to talk about i'll be honest with you um or <laughs> <laughs> i feel like i've got a lot on but i will say this you know in our recent podcast episodes we've used the term anti-fragile or you just used uh, uh another word that i like is like resolve resolve yeah resolve, um, resolve resilience resilient. yeah um, my wife, Megan, and I, we've been talking about resilience quite a bit of, um, if we're going to thrive and continue to be, um, effective and, uh, fully engaged, uh, with the mission, we've got to develop resilience. And, uh, so whether you're using the anti-fragile resilience resolve, whatever you want to use that to me is the vision cast to lean into this topic, um, of it matters for us to be able to be fully engaged and continue, um, or, um, I'm aware of what you're saying. In fact, I've done what you're saying, like developing unhealthy coping mechanisms to the, cause the, the reality is what you're saying is those things are going to happen. You can't avoid them happening. We can avoid the topic right. if we want, those things are going to happen to us whether we make a plan for how we're going to respond to them or we don't, they're going to happen. And then we're going to respond somehow. So this is basically saying like, how do we lean into that topic and make sure that we're responding in a healthy, good way. So those are, I guess my initial thoughts on it, that it matters and it matters for those reasons. And we need to, we need to have some thoughts and a plan ahead of time. Well, we, when we talked about that anti-fragility topic, we were using the illustration of the marathoners bones because it's so helpful that when a marathoner is running, it's cracking, you know, their leg bones are just getting small little hairline cracks in them all the time, but their body reheals. And as their body, those bones heal, those hairline cracks, the actual strength of the bones is stronger than it was before. And it's the actual kind of continual pummeling of the bones and the stress on the bones that causes them to um, grow stronger. But I think the key in what we're wanting to get after today is if we don't acknowledge that we've got these stress fractures that are going to be happening to us as leaders, then we're not going to heal correctly. And that healing process is just as important as the stress fractures. So I think it behooves us uh, as people who sit around and talk about growing leaders and challenging leaders to not avoid the difficult, to not avoid the suffering, to not avoid the conflict, to lean into those things, right? If we're going to be ch uh, planting churches, we're spiritually attacking the enemy's territory. There's going to be conflict. There's going to be blowback. There's going to be stressors. Okay. 
if we do that and we don't learn how to heal from those things properly, then we're not going to grow stronger. We're actually going to fall apart. And I think that's the kicker is what does the scriptures teach us about lament? What does the scriptures teach us from leaders, from the from the word of God and from the prophets about how they dealt with God? What are you up to? What are you doing? I don't understand what's going on and how they dealt with those things matters greatly. There's an entire book dedicated to it. If you've never read Lamentations, I understand why people avoid it. But if you've never read Lamentations, it's a really good book to read on this subject. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so Dave, here's how we'll do the rest of the podcast. Um, I don't know how to respond to this topic. I don't know. I don't even know what thoughts to have, or like you said, uh, going to in scripture, um, talk to me like everybody else that's listening. Uh, where should I go, Dave? Where should I get started in engaging with the word on this topic? Well, I mean, the easiest place to go is the Psalms. Uh, I think everybody recognizes that, that there is emotion in the Psalm. And so we're strategy-based kind of guys. We like to talk about activity. We like to talk about plans. We like to, like to talk about mission. Um, and so sometimes it's detached from emotion. But there is a lot of passion that goes into what we talk about. And so for you and I, people who are kind of wired like us, passion is a major part of how and why we do what we do. We do. We're driven because we're emotionally attached to an idea that we attach our identity to, we attach our calling to, we attach all those things to. And as men in particular, I find that men have a really strong attachment to what they think the future could hold, dreams, opportunities, possibilities. And as an example, one of the hardest things for men to give up, ironically, is something that doesn't exist yet, and that's a dream. Um, we will mourn a dream that we have to give up more than we will probably mourn something that we already have and have to give up um, because there's hope in it, right? So there is a lot of emotion that's involved in ours, but we tend to talk about the positive side, the passionate side of it. What do we do when life goes wrong? When our hopes, our dreams, our vision, our intentions don't pan out when we want them or how that we want them. Um, I'll just give you a good story for me in particular. Uh, there was a point in the work in Oklahoma City where you were actually still in Oklahoma City. Um, and I go back to this a lot, but um, we had a gentleman that was really kind of tearing apart a lot of the relationships and things that was going on, wreaking havoc and not behaving in healthy ways for our network. And um, I thought the whole thing was about to fly apart. And I remember one particular afternoon where I was driving from one of my south locations to one of our north locations. And uh, I just pulled over on the side of the road because honestly, I couldn't even drive because of the tears. Like I was just in my truck. Uh, and there was a particular song that came on. It wasn't a worship song. It was actually a country song because I listen to country music all the time. <laughs> but, but it had just sparked in me this understanding of I haven't dealt with the fact that I'm about to lose everything. And whenever it finally, I have finally allowed it to go, this is a possibility that everything that we worked for to this point could all just be gone and evaporate in the next month or two. Um, I had to have myself a really good cry, right? And it wasn't a, it wasn't a cute cry, um, like the girls call it, like I was weeping in my car. And um, that weeping was commingled with prayer, but there wasn't a way for me to actually get words out for how frustrated, angry, how much loss I was feeling at that moment. And I think that mark is the point at which the lamentations and the, the lamentations of, of Psalms and then the book of lamentations by the prophet Jeremiah. Those are the place in scripture that really point at that place, because what we're seeing is them trying to put into words loss and uh, um, an inability to really understand what is God doing in such a way that they almost sound like they're angry and they're blaming God, but there's an element of trust that's still within this that says, I'm really mad about what's going on. I'm really hurt about what's going on, but I still trust you, and I need you to show me in the middle of all of this how my faith can get back to where it was, because in essence— we run to those crisis moments where our faith is on the line. And I think, Mark, 
That is why this lament is so important. Because if we don't deal with that crisis of faith moment where we're choosing, am I still going to believe or not? In other words, is this going to be the time when I'm going to hang it up and say enough is enough? If we don't lament and we don't deal with our emotion and we don't deal with the loss or we don't deal with the crisis or we don't allow ourselves to heal in that moment, we're going to walk away less faithful when we could walk away more faithful. And the difference between those two times is just allowing ourselves to be real before God and then allowing God to speak truth into our lives and be ready to receive that truth. And sometimes that truth is, like we see in the book of Lamentations, I've got a larger plan at stake and you're playing a role. You still need to trust me. Um, and I think you watch as the Psalms, you'll watch the psalmist and he'll be like, start off, God, where are you? Have you forgotten me? Have you forgotten your people? Are you even listening to what we're doing? And then he'll go through and here's what's happening and here's why it's happening. And then he'll end up going, but we're wrong. We need to repent. You're still faithful. And you'll watch him constantly in the Psalms start with, where are you? What are you doing? I'm mad. I'm angry. It's, are you even listening? Yes, I know you're listening. The reason I know you're listening is because your word says that you're listening. Here's the things that you've done in the past that have proven to me that you're here. And so I will worship you even now because I know you're going to be faithful as you were in the past. Um, so I don't know if any of that's making sense or sparking any of thoughts for you, but I think that's really an important role of what lamentation and that good cry, that healthy pattern of releasing frustration is good for well what i like about what you said dave there's there's several things in there that are really helpful but uh i mean just pointing to the the psalms as a starting place um is great and you know sometimes when i've read through the psalms in the past um i'm like dude this this guy especially david he's a basket case he's all over the place he's got he's like he's an emotional mess man he's uh, an emotional mess sometimes and then, but then like what almost like I can get into this place of like, well, I'm not, I'm not like that. But I mean, the reality is uh, what you're saying is like, he, he was willing to go there and, uh, and walk through and walk through the, the valley of the shadow of death, walk through the, the reality of the situation. Um, and, um, and really the risk, it's a risk. I think that's part of it. What's what jumps out to me is he's willing to go there. And then the risk is I'm going to. I'm going to open myself up to God speaking into this. And I know I got theoretically know his character. I know he wants to, what he wants to say to me in it. And I'm going to reflect back his word, but there's a plate, there's a part of it that feels like a risk to open that up. And like, God, are you going to come through again in this specific situation? So to me, I think that's, that's what jumps out about it is um, I'm going to have hard situations. If I choose to go there with God um, it gives him space to reaffirm and strengthen my faith, uh, but it requires a risk. And then if I don't, um, the, the problem doesn't go away. I'm going to have to cope with it some way, and I'm going to come up with some way to cope with it that won't be healthy. It could get very unhealthy. There's an element, an essence of it that says, I think that crisis of faith is, it is core to these moments. And that crisis of faith is going to be when we have believed God for something, whatever it may be. Um, it could be a relationship. It could be a church plant. It could be a disciple. It could be as big as I, God, I, I believe you for a movement across, you know, this country among this people. Um, and we put dreams, goals, visions on the table. And when those things don't come to fruition, we, we will find ourselves at a crisis of faith. And it's going to happen right? It's going to happen. Um, and sometimes we don't even know when it's coming. It might come from our own heart, or it also might come from a comment of somebody else that all of a sudden causes us to go, I didn't realize how frustrated I was. And then I watch fear or anger just suddenly burst out of my mouth. And then I go, whoa, where did that come from? And the answer is I'm walking in fear, not in faith. And I just have been you know, pushing it down and trying to candy coat it with, I believe, I believe, I believe, but we have to deal with that fear. Um, we have to deal with that anger. And that crisis of belief is the moment when we're going to say, um, I'm okay with letting go of whatever I thought something was going to be. And we have to mourn that loss. Sometimes that loss is physical. Like if someone passes away, 
Um, that is, I, I mean, everybody at some point or another is going to deal with death. You're know, like, oh, this is a great podcast. We're going to talk about death. Um, but at some point, you're everybody has to deal with that. It's a reality in life. Right. Um, which is which is ironic. It's a reality in sinful life. Um, so that's a real physical thing. But at the same time, when you're a passionate leader, you will get just as passionate about something. And and it may not be a physical loss of life, but when you lose something that you've given your life to, there's a real loss that you have to deal with yeah. in that. And the questions that people ask when there's an actual physical death, God, where are you? Why did things happen? Why, why do bad things happen? Why wasn't it somebody else? Why wasn't it me? All those questions, all those things that come up, they're all one, they're all encapsulated in one thing. And that is, God, can I trust you? Can I still trust you with the answers that I don't know? And a healthy lament will be leaning into God and going to him and saying, here's who I am. Here's where I'm at. Emotionally, this is where I am. And even if I'm unstable at that point, even if my faith is weak, I think we can come to the place to where the one story in scripture that sticks out to me the most is uh, uh, Thomas. He gets such a bad rap, right? Uh, doubting Thomas is you know, what he's called. But, but everybody goes, oh, doubting Thomas. But we forget that when Jesus was walking to Jerusalem, Thomas was the first one to say, let's go die with him. Like Thomas is like, let's go, right? So He's not as weak in his faith as, as they seem. But when we see them come to him and they say, he's alive. And Thomas says, unless I see the holes in his hands and the scar on his side, I'm not going to believe it. Why did Thomas respond that way? And the answer is he was at a crisis of faith. He was hurt. He had experienced tremendous loss. And he thought he was following the Messiah of his people. And he was. But in that moment, this man who held all of this promise is now dead. Yeah. Thomas is in, he's what you just described. He's all over the place. This joker in this moment doesn't have a clue what his life even holds. He can't even think about what he's going to do next week because what next week included was Jesus. Yeah. And now Jesus is gone and uh -huh. he was gone quickly and he was gone in a spectacularly bad fashion um, publicly. And so he says, I'm not going to believe it unless I see it. But we see this picture because Jesus shows up to Thomas and he does not scold him whenever he comes to Thomas. He just right. comes to Thomas and he says, Thomas, I understand. Look, look at my hands. Look at my side. And Thomas's response is, Lord, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. That that moment is lament. Yeah, that's good. I want to believe. I want to believe. But I need things, and I know I shouldn't need these things, but I still need these things. Help me in my unbelief. And I think the Lord's response to us in these times is not, how could your faith be so weak? His response to these in this time is a smoldering wick he will not snuff out, and a bruised right. reed he will not break. This is the moment when our Savior, like, shines. This is this is what he is better at than anybody on the planet, right? If, if he is good at better than anything, but... At this juncture, this is when our Savior is good. This is when he becomes the balm um, of Jeremiah, as we'd say, the balm of Gilead, that, that salve that just takes the hurt and the scratch and the pain and the wound and all the things that we don't know what to do with. And he just puts the ointment on it and he heals it. And he heals it by saying, I love you. I'm here. I'm always with you. And what about what comes next? Because his next statement is, um, how good is it you that you believe, Thomas, but what about those who believe having never seen. Yeah. Right? Right. Jesus immediately points him back to the mission and says, we're still on the same path. It's just that this path doesn't look like you thought it should look. Right. But it hasn't changed. And that is the element, I think, for us as leaders, that if we will learn to just go, Lord, I believe, I really do believe, but right now my faith is it feels tiny. Like, I feel like I'm about to just fall away and say enough is enough. If we come to him and say, help me in my unbelief, instead of coming to him and saying, don't scold me for my, for my small faith, we come to him and say, I believe, just help me in this moment, my unbelief. The answer is, smoldering with wick, he wills not stuff out. And a bruised reed, he will not break. And he will bring us back, but he'll bring us back stronger, even more faithful. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense, Dave. I think uh, the 
the other verse that's coming up in my heart that kind of connects where we started of the resilience resolve piece that God desires to, to cultivate in us is Jesus's statement that uh, when he returns, will he find faith um, on the earth? And um, that's not a gutted out, just like if we'll just push through and have this faith. I mean, the reality is that the, uh, the days that we live in, the end time that started in Acts 2 and continues till the return of Christ are filled with just a lot of turmoil and a lot of different things. Uh, the whirlwind, we sometimes call it. And so um, it feels like sobering and like super relevant, not only for me personally, but to the to the accomplishing and the faithfulness of the mission that we've got to lean into that. Yeah. So let's I'm, I'm with you. You like to get super practical. What are some super practical ways that you in your own life uh, in the healthy ways, have learned to decompress, rest, release frustration so that you can stay on task and not let it build up to the point to where there's an explosion of fear and anger. But a healthy pattern of a way of leaders, we can deal with this frustration, we can deal with this disappointment, we can deal with loss. What are some healthy patterns that you think are good for just the everyday whirlwind that just can constantly just batters at us? Uh, well, to be honest, Dave, I think that the 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 word that I don't hear people often talk about when it comes to uh, spiritual formation is stop. And I will talk about like, what do you do? Do you use this format? Do you read the Bible this way? All that stuff. But all that kind of assumes that I have uh, thought through and I've made a plan to stop what I'm doing. And so to make space for any of this, I've got to have a, a pause in my day, a pause in my week, a pause in my lifestyle. And so we've got uh, some different ways that we stop. Once a week, we've got a, a Sabbath day where uh, my wife, Meg, and I, we get physically away from our space and we're, we're, we're pausing, we're stopping. And that allows all of the, the beginning of the practical process you're talking about. But I think to, that's what I've found over the last couple of years, especially being up here in New York is we just need to be really proactive to have times and I, and I get up early as well, but having times where I'm actually stopping um, from the activity that allows everything, all the other dominoes to fall, but not having that um, before that time um, I had a value for it. It was like, maybe it'll come up here and there, but just actually planning a time to stop was, was the biggest key. How important have retreats, uh, away from the city, been to your family since you've uh, experienced the nonstopness, the grind of New York? Uh, they're important. They're, they're like I would say they're critical, actually. Um, and it's because uh, our our buffer our buffer gets full of stuff, and uh, just the the day to day, the week to week, the month to month stuff builds up, and uh, we don't even realize it is what we've come to understand. We don't realize it, and just the pause and the getaway allows us to even assess, oh yeah, I guess I was processing through all these things or I had all this stuff that I haven't thought through that I didn't even realize was there. So mm -hmm. it's it's pretty critical for clearing the buffer out. I think those pauses are super critical for decompression because one of the core things that has to happen in order for us to not just get bombarded and overwhelmed is to be able to step back get out of the details and jump back up in the larger picture. The same thing that True. Jesus did for Thomas was think about those who are going to believe who haven't ever seen me. He immediately pushes him back to remember what we're about. Remember what the mission is. Remember what we're really doing. I'm here. I'm alive. You believe. I trust you. Let's go back to the purpose we're doing. Those pauses allow us to get out of the details and then jump back up to, okay, what are we actually about and what are we doing? And then it allows us to put into perspective the weight of a particular moment. One of the things that I think is really important is every moment matters. I say that all the time, but every moment is not so important that if I fail in that moment, that it's going to wreck all the moments in the future. In other words, the moment that I'm in now is a very important moment. But if I fail in this one, I can I can do it again later in another moment and get it better and get it right the next time. And so I think like for me in business, if I have one customer that's just persnickety, right? If I just get lamb blasted, because some customers will go absolutely terribly stupid and they'll yell, they'll cuss, they'll I mean, you know, go nuts and they'll do it for 30 minutes, right? Just because they're mad. They're usually not mad at me. I just happen to be the best outlet, right? Because 
I'm experiencing a moment for that customer where they haven't learned this process of decompression. They haven't learned the process of releasing frustrations and rest. And so they're mad about a lot of things in the world. And I'm just a lowly dry cleaner. And I'm a person that's not going to be related to anybody they're upset at. And so if they release all that on me, I kind of look at it and go, well, that was terrible. And on a good day, I'll be like, I'm glad that I was able to take that so that other people in their lives don't have to take that. On a bad day for me, I'm like, I don't want to put up with this person, right? <laughs> I don't have time for you. But whenever all those kind of things happen and you see that type of frustrations that come in, you can st stop for a moment and you can be like, okay, this customer represents everything that's happening and now my business is about to collapse. You can get in that mindset. Does that make sense? You can get a wrong perspective and think that yeah. that one moment represents everything. And then you start to see everything, the big picture through that lens, and it clouds your thinking and it, yeah. and it, it jades your thinking to everything is this way. Or yeah. I can step back and I can go, okay, I've interacted with 100 customers today. 99 of them were like, this is awesome. This is great. Had good conversations. One out of the 99 had a bad day. If I put that in perspective, then I'm like, we're 99% doing well with customers today in my perspective. Don't let that one ruin everything. Right? Yeah. That's a decompression, releasing frustration, rest pattern. Pause. This doesn't represent everything. The bigger picture is we're doing okay. And if we're not doing okay, bigger picture, then I know how to fix those things. I can go back into, okay, what do I need to do to engage and, and have those? That pause moment allows us to go, what's the bigger picture? What are we really after? And does this particular moment that's been frustrating represent everything? That's good. That's good. One other one I want to, before we jump into some uh, just unhealthy habits that we definitely need to avoid. There's some positive aspects to this as well. Um, I'll give a great example. When you moved to New York, um, I had to have myself a good cry over that, right? It's a good thing. I want your family to go there. We want to expand. We want Oklahoma City to take what we've had here. And we want to see that go to New York as well. And you guys right. represented that. Um, right. And so there's an aspect. And you and I had a good conversation about it um, where one of the, the balms for me from the scripture for a relationship that's going to be geographically, you know, separated, um, that I enjoy is, uh, and I said it to you this way, if we're separated for 70 years geographically here on earth, it's okay. We'll spend a billion hanging out together in eternity. Yes. That, that, that's that pause. And then going to the bigger picture and the yeah. eternal focus of scripture, I think is one of the most key elements to the entirety of this healing is that we understand that that's good. Nothing that we're experiencing here is permanent uh, other than the eternal state of our souls and the word of God, everything else is going to pass away. And so that passing is a natural part of this process, but we cling to the word we cling to uh, eternity with Jesus, then everyone that's on that side is going to be the permanent that we get to enjoy. And there's hope, right? An eternal hope in the future that yeah. we can set our assurance on. Yeah, that's good. And it, it it points us back towards something that you talk about a lot and probably not in the recent times we've been podcasting, but just uh, that, that means I've got to know the word of God and I've got to have um, enough regular touch points with uh, God's word and large quantities of God's word to be able to uh, to do that in that pause moment. And there's got to be space in our communities to allow someone to have a season of lament if it's necessary and to not chastise them about, you know, you're you're bowing out. Sometimes we just need that stop. And if the frustration or the hurt or the whatever, that stop's going to be a little bit longer than it was before. And I think you've got to have, that's why the community of leadership, community of the church is so crucial to this because you don't need to do this on your own because those other people are going to remind you of the eternal perspectives, right? And they're going to be there to yeah. encourage you, to love you, um, to be there, but also understand that everything has a season. And so there has to come a point at which your lament turns to rejoicing. And when your heart makes that shift, that's whenever it's time to get back up on the on the faith wagon, right? And get active again. Because when you find that spark of joy in the middle of the lament, that's the spirit's breakthrough that's saying, now you believe, you understand, even if you don't get answers to all your questions, that trust has now renewed and that joy comes right in the morning. Yeah. And as soon as you see that, the way in which you spark that joy is you get back into mission, you get back into practice, you get back into obedience. Not that 
stopping is disobedience, but the the practice of of the purpose of disciple making and all those things will take that spark and it will f- turn it into flame again for you. If you Good. take that joy and you don't get started and you just sit and lament, you'll you'll start to grieve the spirit and you'll squash it and you'll find yourself having a harder time getting back in the great in the game. It's good, Dave. That's good. Yeah, I feel uh, I feel provoked by this to get some time with the Lord and process it. Uh, I will pr- point out just two or three things. Um, unhealthy habits, you need to pay close attention to those unhealthy habits, hmm. um, especially if you're somebody who is a pretty faithful person or does a lot of things. You might get a few of them and you go, oh, I can handle this. I'll be OK. I can I can take care of this. Um, but there's some really natural unhealthy habits that will happen. Um, and yeah. there are usually ways that you avoid things. So just pay attention to social media is a great way that people can just mind numbingly avoid stuff. Right. But if what you're mind numbing your mind with is going to be unhealthy content, just realize that it's rewiring your brain to think in unhealthy ways. Yep. Right. Um, I will say that, um, We'll, we'll get in the, the drinking game. Um, you know, I've known leaders that would just like, you know, like I'll have a drink or whatever. And then that drinking turned into something that was way worse than it possibly could be because they continued to excuse um, a social drink as something that was actually covering over frustrations. And that frustration led to yeah. worse decisions, worse decisions, and it can take you down a really bad path. Some other really unhealthy things uh, to do is uh, just mind numbing, sitting and doing nothing on a couch. Yeah. Because if if you, some ways that I decompress that are really well, I've got a pool in my backyard and I love to just go out and sit in my pool and I'll float around or do whatever, but whatever I get really high stress. It's like, I just need something that soothes me or I'll go take a walk, Right. Um, or I'll sit down and for me, I'll just read the scriptures, but I'm not looking for anything in particular. I'm just letting the scriptures, you know, go over. I like, I'm an outdoors guy. I'm a country boy. And so I also like to go fishing if I can. Yeah. Um, but just going outside, change of pace, different location. Um, and usually for me, it requires that I get away from people for a little bit. Um, and then the other one for me that it's huge is my wife. She's a God's grace gift. And all I've got to do is just sit next to her and the world becomes better most of the time. And so those are just some ways that I healthy in healthy ways that, you know, I decompress rather than taking um, addictional habits that are going to ruin me. Good. And we can sit here and list a lot of leaders who have went addictional pathways and it destroyed them. Yeah. Yeah, we could. Well, that's sobering, Dave, to uh, to hear both the 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 vision that God's given to us of uh, being faithful to Him, and then uh, what can what positively if we'll lament, but also if we don't deal with it, um, we're gonna we're it's gonna happen. We're gonna have to do something about it, and we're naturally gonna come up with some sort of pattern and default to what we've already done, or uh, or we can develop that that pathway for us. So it's good. And I'll I'll say this as we finish up too. I know a lot of people have crisis of faith. Um, it happens a lot. Find somebody that you can just bounce it off of. It's a godly right. person and just say, hey, here's my perspective. Here's what I'm seeing. Here's what I'm frustrated with. And then let them speak back to you and say, here's two or three other ways you could actually look at this. It's not always exactly the way that you perceive and allow someone into this to speak some truth into your life so that you don't start to believe a lie in the process of this. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. Yeah. Fun subject. You're welcome, everybody who's listening in. I'm glad we made your day so happy. <laughs> We touch on the head, the heart, and the hands, and it's all critical. So thanks for bringing this today, Dave. Thanks for listening, for watching. If this content has been helpful for you, please take a minute to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. It really helps us to get this content out there farther to serve Jesus, grow his kingdom, and accomplish the Great Commission until there is no place left. Much love to you guys. See you next time.